problems we didn't anticipate when we started the court. And, and yes, definitely correct. But some people think you know, that that's an advantage. I, I would list the creation of the suburbs as a disadvantage of the automobile, but some people see it differently. I think antibiotics is sort of the almost the perfect example of this, because I think everyone would agree uh, we know what problem antibiotics solve, and we know that it solves it for almost everybody, but at the same time, it weakens what we call our immune system. So that creates a new problem created by solving an old problem. Is there a problem for which that is the solution? Are yes. people having a hard time hearing in the back? Very good. Okay. No, so one is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> is the, I don't know. So I'm going to bring it to you. Is this magnifying my voice? Yes. Do you all hear me? So, see? Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, if, if that had cost me money to do, then it would be especially wise for me to say, uh, I did, uh, I think Jonathan remembers last time I was here, I did talk about this um, Honda, this car I bought, I don't know if you remember, I went to buy uh, this, uh, what, what is the model, a Honda, Accord? No, Accord, thank you. Honda Accord. So the salesman says it has cruise control, for which, of course, there's an extra charge. What did I ask him? Good. No, watch cruise control. <laughs> I knew what cruise control was. Does it have rust yeah, proofing yeah, too? No. I said, what is the problem to which cruise control is the solution? Well, he said no one had actually asked him that before, but he thought for a minute, and he said it's the problem of keeping your foot on the gas. So I said I'd been driving for 35 years, and I'd never found this to be a problem. He said, you know, this car has electric windows. <laughs> I said, what is the question I asked him? What is the problem? Oh, good. I thought you were going to say, I asked him, what are electric windows? <laughs> no. uh, so I asked him that question, and he was ready for me this time. He said, oh, it's the problem of not having to do, to do this, or even worse, this. So I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm an academic. I, I live a sort of sedate life. Any little exercise I can do is all right with me. Now, here's the punchline in a way. I bought the Honda uh, with the cruise control, which, by the way, I've never used since I got it, but with the cruise control and, and with electric windows because you can't get this car without those things. So that's sort of an interesting point because many people say new technologies are wide our options, and sometimes they do, but sometimes they also close off options. You know, they can widen and they can close. Sometimes they do both. They open a new option and close it off another one. So I'm not a neo-Luddite and I'm not anti-technology. My whole thing is just to raise questions about the role that technology plays um, in our lives and in our culture. And uh, by doing that, try to get some control over it. Uh, Finally, before I invite you in, which I'm anxious to do, um, when I've, I've been at New York University for a long time, uh, actually, Jonathan, if I live another, uh, what is today, November? Seven. Seven. Today's the seventh? No, see. I was relying on my watch. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, in 1750, 
Lucille threw away his watch. But I found it. Yeah. <laughs> he said, thank heavens, I'll never have to know what time it is again. Um, well, whenever the year 2000 comes, once it's about 40 days or so, if I make it uh, to then, I will have been at New York University <coughs> for six decades. Because my first class was in February 1959. Then my math skills have deteriorated as I've gotten older. But I think that's six decades, isn't it? 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 2000. When I first got to NYU, it was fairly a primitive, technologically speaking, I mean, by today's standards. Uh, students could read, they could write, uh, they were pretty good listeners and the speakers, and the same for the professors. Um, as for sort of audio-visual uh, machinery, uh, there was very little. By the way, students still could write their papers in longhand, uh, many typed on, on Smith Coronas. Uh, but uh, it was not objectionable to hand in a paper that was written in, as we said, longhand. Uh, occasionally, a professor would show a film, but it always broke. The projector, <laughs> and you learn pretty quickly, plan to have it break, and so on. Uh, uh, so I, I, so now NYU is uh, pretty uh, up to date technologically. Um, as a matter of fact, John, when I was in New York class, not the lecture, but uh, what was that class? Uh, in yeah. society. Yeah, and uh, and all the students had these machines out. Remember when it started? I didn't even, it was very scary. <laughs> Suddenly, all these things came in front of the desk. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was dangerous. <laughs> uh, but at NYU, too, you have all this stuff the latest, and everyone has a computer except me, um, and uh, I asked myself, all right, let's, let's, let me be fair here. Now, let's compare the way I remember it back in 1960 with what it is now. Are the students smarter? Do they have more knowledge? Uh, do they write better? Do they read better? Uh, are, are the teachers better teachers? Are their books more interesting? Are the conversations more substantive? So I try to ask my, because NYU, like the Harvard, has, has probably spent a billion dollars on all this shit. Oh, what did I say? <laughs> on all this stuff. So it's a fair question, isn't it? If you make an investment like this, uh, are, are we better off in some sense? So I ask those key questions because that sense uh, were especially important to me. Do people read, write better? Think do they make more uh, perceptive comments in class, uh, and so on? And I came to the conclusion: No, the teachers are not better teachers. Their books are not more interesting. Not. A better written, their conversations are a little less interesting because now about, oh, maybe 15% of the conversations are about the technology that they've used. Whereas in the earlier period I'm talking about, I mean, what could you say about a pen? <laughs> yeah. Does that ink? And that's the end of the conversation. Uh, but now a lot of time is taken up uh, talking about which computer is better and, and so on. So that's not so interesting. But I, and the students, they, uh, they're not dumber, definitely not, although they, um, they have less knowledge in their heads. I mean, they, they carry around less knowledge, although they claim they have quicker access knowledge if they need it, but they're less sure about what knowledge they need, which, you know, is the downside of that. Uh, so I've come to the conclusion 
that they're not much after a billion dollar investment and all of this celebration of the uh, new world, uh, we're not, uh, at least where I am, very much better off. Uh, in fact, I think we're like two yards back from where we were. So, if this be an anti-technology person, then I will plead guilty. But I don't think of myself <clears throat> that way. Just someone who is um, uh, tries to be thoughtful about what this is doing to us and whether it makes us better or worse. Incidentally, the same argument uh, Rousseau brought us uh, in 1749 when he wrote the famous essay, or the essay that made him famous, in which he asked if scientific, he was not just talking about technological knowledge, but scientific knowledge and techno uh, technological knowledge uh, made us more moral. Did it corrupt our morals or um, enhance our morals? And he concluded, of course, that it uh, uh, corrupted, but not very necessarily agree with him there. But uh, it's the sort of question I think we have to ask uh, to have a serious dialogue, especially if you're going to spend billions of dollars, because I'll give you an example. Two years, there are 1,100,000 children in the New York City school system. Two years ago, on the first day of school, when the children showed up, 90,000 of them did not have seats. Do you hear what I'm saying? There were no seats for 90,000 children. And many of these children had to meet their classes, I'm talking about even first and second and third graders, in the bathrooms. Now this is a school system that is seriously considering spending hundreds of millions of dollars or more on wiring each classroom to the internet. So tell me where I'm wrong here. If I missed something, would I be a, um, a Luddite, hopeless reactionary if I said I wouldn't spend a goddamn nickel on a computer until every kid had a seat? Would you go along with me there, or have I missed something? Uh, so, yes? Yeah, but meanwhile, we have the kids in the bathroom. Yeah, I've been trying to keep that image in mind, that you have almost 90,000 kids sitting on the floor in the bathroom, and then someone says, well, maybe we can network them long a distance learning. Well, that's possible, maybe in the future. Maybe schools themselves will become obsolete. Uh, it, 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 but that's down the road. Right now, we have a budget to pass. Now, if I'm representing, uh, if I'm at the budget meeting, I say to the Board of Education, I don't want you guys to spend five cents on anything until you make sure the kids don't have to go to class in the bathroom. I was in high school, I was preferred to be. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you were smoking there, that's, that's okay. That's all right. But I don't know about the first and second and third graders, if they were interested in, and I don't think they liked it very much. Um, but that, go out on a limb, right? I mean, yeah. uh, nobody is going to stand up here and say, we should have kids have to meet in the bathroom while we spend our money on computers. Right. Unless it was buy one computer, get three chairs free, which suddenly I could see would be an attractive deal for the computer manufacturers. Well, I, I, I think, Jonathan, you're right. No one states it that way. But at budget meetings, people are saying, well, let's spend, we're going to invest this much money in what they call the future. And we're going to wire the classrooms. And, the, 
and a lot of people don't make the connection between that kind of expenditure, that policy decision, and the fact that there's just not enough seats for the children. Suppose uh, at that meeting, Bill Gates uh, sends a letter. You might not have heard of him, but uh, he has something to do with computers. Gates. Yep. The monopolist. Yeah, yeah. He's got him. Okay. <laughs> So this is his BillGates.org wing. This is his charitable wing. And his foundation says, we are delighted to be able to give you uh, $5 million for the purchase of computers and wires. And uh, your school can have it. It's above and beyond whatever your budget already has. And that's all it can be used for. Simply sign here. We'll send you the check. And that's that. Now, is that a happy occasion at your meeting? Yeah, I will do. I ask him. Uh, I say, Bill, you're very generous. How could we use a million of it to replace some worn out texts or books we have, uh, story books for second graders? Would, would that be all right, Bill? You say fine. Good. It's overhead, they call it. We got a deal. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, the problem, I'm not going to argue that there's a bit going on with your computers versus, like, people and uh, kids. But the problem is you can always make that argument at every level. I mean, we shouldn't be spending any money learning the law here when the children started in Africa. I mean, as long as there's someone out there suffering in some way, there's always a need for me to be able to do that. At some point, you have to stop and tell her, you know, there are those other problems, but we can't afford to be quite those and to be left behind. No, I, I don't think that's a fair point, if I may say it. May I say it? Sure. This is the third one. Let me try to explain why I don't think it is. Because I'm talking about the same context. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the wiring classrooms as against feeding children in, uh, in some East African well, country. I'm talking about the process of schooling them and just simply asking you to address this issue. What would be the priorities that you would list in spending money to school children? That's all. Well, the problem is there's always a difficulty in distributing resources, whether you're acting you know, that's here in Africa or within the New York City school system. I mean, yeah, but uh, inequities have always existed. That's true. But I mean, I'm just asking about this, uh, this. We're at a board of education meeting, and we're we're addressing the question of how we would uh, allocate the limited resources we have towards educating our children. I'm not, I'm not, I, I realize your point about there are always people starving someplace. I remember my mother had a great thing when I didn't finish eating something. You probably heard that too. You know there are children starving in uh, yeah, they're starving in Asia, I think, or no, maybe Europe. And and then and it always occurred to me if you mean if I if I didn't eat this uh, or if I ate it, they wouldn't be starving, you know. So. But but I'm just talking about this for me. Yes, in the back. I was a little scared when you accepted the deal here today. Oh, good. Because I was the question is. Even if you have all the money in the world for education, what do you want computers being used for? And are they being used in ways that create more problems at times than they solve? And are there other times when the same computer um, create more problems than they create? Thank you. Mr. Gates, I want to take back the deal. Everybody saw the yeah, end I'm sorry. Uh, well, you, can, you should sue me now, and maybe you will finally win a case. Uh, here's the thing. It's a good question. I was too quick to accept the deal. I think you're generous to uh, allow me to use a million dollars to buy some books. But I really want to, is it up to me to decide how to use this? Technology, I or, think, or are you going to decide for me? I think you're the best person to decide it. Exactly as you describe yourself as a critic, not in the sense of just 
dumping on something, but a critic isn't a food critic who appreciates food and can distinguish between good food and bad food. I want you to be a technology critic, and I'll give you the money, and I don't want you to say nothing more complicated than a pen will be in the Is this all right with you? Well, it depends. I mean, if you have these boxes sitting in the room, and they look very attractive, you decide that it's a new fun to use it for the question is, are you going to be using them in a way that's helps the kids or not? Or is this very exciting little box going to be a great choice? But in the end, it's like... But, but he's going to leave it up to us, all right? Yes, and there's particularly little risk uh, with him. He doesn't seem charmed by the boxes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not charmed. I like that, Chuck. I'm not charmed by the boxes. Uh, I'm going to ask your help and the help of some uh, other uh, people who, who know something about children, who know something about the computers, uh, and before we oh, even take them out of the boxes, we're going to have some very thoughtful meetings. Maybe it'll take us a year to figure out exactly what we want these things to do. And and then we'll let Mr. Gates know. We may say, you know, we're, we're going to leave them in the boxes. And maybe he wouldn't be too happy about that. Yes, and then, and then you, but I, I think yes. Well, I'll try to make this relevant to the other questions that have been raised. It's very unusual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Educating our society, our humankind. Right. Um, so what is your opinion of NASA and the space program and uh, their impact on sort of American and, and, and first well, yeah. well, NASA and the space program. Well, okay. Well, I have to be very cautious about my answer to that because my oldest son, Mark, is an astrophysicist uh, who works at the Hubble uh, the Space Center. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, if he was sitting in the audience and I said anything against this, uh, I, I, I would, I, you know, I hear about it for years, but he's not here, so. Uh, here's what I, uh, one of the things I like about the space program, and uh, maybe this takes us off the topic a little bit, maybe it doesn't, is that um, I think we Americans are in desperate need of some new transcendent narratives, ideas, uh, I call them the stories, great stories, that will help to give meaning to our lives and give us a sense of purpose and continuity. We used to have some wonderful stories, uh, which I think are waning in this power. Um, I'm not talking about science fiction. I, mean. I am now, but I mean, I was about to mention some other stories. They're all fiction in a way. They're myths. America as um, uh, the moral leader of the world. It's a great story. Uh, people in other countries don't always appreciate it. But it's very, it's been very powerful for Americans. Uh, that revolution we created here was uh, had the authority of the divine behind it. You know these. Uh, so it gives us branches to not one it, it does, yes, indeed. But great things too. Anyway, it's a powerful story. The um, uh, uh, the melting pot story also one that has its downside but the idea that America is the place where people of different races and religions and backgrounds can come and live in harmony and peace I and mean, that's a, an American story well the Protestant ethic the best way to earn God's favor is to deny yourself everything <laughs> work hard Never have a good time, and then you'll enter into God's grace. Another thing about the story. Now, what I like about NASA, because you're wondering, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> here's, here's what I like about it. 
that I think one of the burgeoning narratives has to do, it goes something like this, that we are all crew members on the spaceship, the Earth spaceship. Irrespective of where you come from, doesn't matter. We're all together on this spaceship. And whatever happens in one part of the spaceship, if the, um, the forests in Brazil are disappearing, it's of concern to people in Cambridge, Massachusetts, because it's all the same spaceship. This is an emerging new story. I like it. I like uh, the fact that Steven Spielberg has become one of the tellers of this tale, not only in E.T., but that earlier, what was that? Close Encounters, the third, uh, up the third time, uh, that Americans are beginning to spin this tale, this narrative. And so I like that idea. Mission um, Mars? What? Mission Mars? Love that idea. Because it's mythic. It's something I think uh, we need a story about where we stand in the universe, especially since, as Nietzsche said, uh, God, God is dead. I don't know if that's true. Although he did say, and I think this is true, without God, everything is permissible. So if that is so, we need some other kind of God. And I think the idea that we are stewards of the earth, we're just on our own spaceship and um, uh, that you know that oh, you call you know you call it science fiction but mm -hmm. I think you meant that ironically it's more than that right yeah yeah but well, what about a myth that involves you know, it may become reality that involves connecting every human mind to every other human mind I mean, you can just say the, the, the collective organism of mind I mean, using technology to do this. Yeah. Uh, well, that nervous system for the whole for the whole species. But it's really Yeah. 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 Uh, now, if you're suggesting that that machine does that, then we would have to have a long conversation. I think it might. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Doing it. I know, that's why we have to have a long <laughs> Now, yes. I just wanted to, about this uh, sort of faith uh, program, one of the things that struck me when I met my dental friend in the Air and Space Museum in Washington is that every, they, they have this little section where they have these stamps and never any, like, sort of And what's striking about it is that it's kind of similar, like, like over 100 different times. Well, that, I agree with you, uh, but I think you're making a point, because, uh, it, tell me if I'm wrong about this, that, oh, I'm sorry, I guess in a sec, uh, that you, you were making the point that uh, uh, investing in uh, uh, millions and millions of dollars in take wiring classrooms uh, is some kind of investment in the future and we might have to look past this immediate problem of kids in the bathroom, right? Is that at, at some level? Yeah. I mean, you know, right. There are programs where I have interested kids in the 
so can I manage to move to another At some level, it's, it's an escape. All right. Well, uh, then there might be a point to what you're making that we might, uh, uh, but but there would be still some other questions to ask. For example, if we're going to ignore those kids sitting in the bathroom, uh, we probably should have a very serious conversation about why we're ignoring them. What is it that we're shooting for here? that will give us something very rich in the future so that in the end we have to say we're really sorry you had to sit there but we actually did something significant here uh, so then we have to discuss uh, exactly what we're doing here now uh, a couple of those are two summers ago a um, fellow named Oppenheim I think uh, you could check it out because you have your computers. Uh, it was in the Atlantic, the Atlantic. I don't think it's called the Atlantic Monthly anymore. It's the Atlantic. And it was in the summer, two years ago, so you can get it. And his name was either Oppenheim or Oppenheim. I can't remember. Uh, he did an article in which he surveyed all, at, at almost uh, every example of computer use in schools. Not everyone, but a very representative sample. And then ask the question is, is there any evidence that kids are getting smarter in any sense from this? Now his conclusion, and it was just, it was a very substantial study, but I mean there, there could be others later on that will find different things is that um, basically you accomplished one thing if you had PCs in, in classrooms. Kids learn how to use computers. But if you asked, do they know history better, philosophy better, or uh, science better, or any other subject, do they read better, write better, the answer is a resounding no. So that raised another issue. Since about 45 million Americans already have figured out how to use computers without any help whatsoever from the schools, if the schools did nothing in the next 10 years, we could be pretty sure most people will have figured out how to do this, the way everyone learned how to drive without any help from the schools. Uh, but, I mean, that's what I mean, we'd have to have a serious conversation. But you're making a very uh, a powerful point. You're leaving these kids. The Todd Oppenheimer, the computer delusion. Yeah, what is it? Todd Oppenheimer, the computer delusion. Todd Oppenheimer, the computer delusion. No, no. But, <laughs> but I want him to look at it. Anyway, I'm sorry I missed you. You, you don't mind it. Yes. Um, I just wanted to maybe try and move together the Earth is spaceship. Uh, the spaceship, yeah. Uh, back where we're talking about before about the education moment. You know, the, there's a big difference between sort of space program and an educational question because um, you have to recognize the reality that was in America that the educational policies are made at a really local level. And so you know, the people, the, the issues that are in the people's minds are making this decision and the president of the Sun of the Internet School. If not, uh, is this going to take us on spaceship Earth to a greater place? It's going to be, are my kids keeping up with kids on the street? Are they going to be as competitive in the airport? They're not centralized decisions, so people aren't going to be thinking in that kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know a couple of, I, Here's an interesting question. Someone just brought this up yesterday. I was at a, uh, a, a conference, um, and this is about technology, too. It's, it's, I, I mean, I, I think we're answering a point, but this, this just occurred to me. So I was giving a talk against uh, testing, you know, SATs and so on. And then someone said this, isn't this uh, uh, IQ testing and SAT testing, isn't this more democratic than older ways of determining 
who would enter school. And he was using Ivy League schools, but he had a lot of data there that there was a time, by the way, I think uh, one of the little trickets that popped up that I do remember is that um, 85% today of the Princeton undergraduate students do not qualify for any student loans or aid because their parents make uh, in excess of $300,000 a year. This is at Princeton, uh, which is sort of interesting because someone was making the argument that to get into Princeton, Yale, probably was it that way at Harvard uh, and the other Ivy League schools, you had to be rich, you had to have connections, uh, you had to be part of a cultural elite. And the argument was being made, now along comes the technological means of measuring people's brain power, and isn't that, and that in theory is supposed to replace political and cultural power as a means of getting in, but it turns out that it's not really doing that. But I mean, if it did that, would we consider that an advance in democracy? And look, we don't care where your parents come from, we're just going to give you this test. And those who score above a certain number will let in and, and those others will let out. Well, it's very interesting discussion about that. Because then, and this sort of related to the point, I mean, you might say, yeah, that is a better way. But let's have a conversation about the test. And is, is the test doing what it says it's doing? Is it possible to quantify what we're talking about to begin with? Now, if we discover the test isn't doing that at all, then we've made a bad bargain. Might as well keep the other way of doing it, or find another way entirely. So, there, there, there were a couple of people that I, I know on this, but I you keep the, talking. You, you pretty much said what you have been saying. Right. That's not the There's a lot of things wrong with it in general. Yeah. I, the, the question of educa uh, technology education is a larger one, I think. Yeah. You wanted to say something, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. N not that I see. Okay, so it's not what happened in the of the technology. We allowed them to get them done faster, so we've got four more external ways to the collection of the inner, or even better than experiments and all Well, see, there, you know, there is something, a very important idea that I think we should discuss. Uh, uh, the function of speed in our lives. Uh, you know, even when I was in the fifth grade, I, I that, Tell you how really brilliant I am. I thought about this because I took one of these IQ tests, and you do it and you know you get like a half hour for a certain section or 20 minutes, and I was doing great. And the teacher said, I, I read this question, and I was about to fill in the you know the blank. And the teacher said, time's up. I, remember, I could still hear her words ringing in my ear. Time's up. And I filled it in. She went ballistic. She accused me of all sorts of awful things and said that the test now is invalid. <laughs> and I remember I was in the fifth grade thinking, one of us is wacky. <laughs> I knew the answer to this. And all I did, and, and I didn't look at anyone else's paper, I put the answer in. So she said, time's up, big deal. She thought it was a big deal. Test makers think that's a big deal. So then I began to think, what is this thing about speed? Where is the connection? Who made the connection between the faster you could think about something, the better you are as a thinker? Where did that come from? The Industrial Revolution. All right. 
I mean, you can begin to discuss this. Now, I know that's not exactly the question you're raising, but, yeah, but I mean that idea of, you say, well, the kids will be able to do certain things faster, will be more convenient. Um, well, we have to say, that could be so. I mean, that's one thing I didn't really look at. I didn't have, uh, I didn't have the uh, interest, I guess, that I should have, to, to find out, um, is, it, is your life more, um, com is the word commodious? Is that a word? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can tell you this. Let's, to get away from kids for a minute, to grown-ups I know, that the new technologies have made their lives more frenetic, more frantic, more disorganized than ever. Now, I mean, you know, something that can start out as a great benefit to the human race could turn into a despot people running around, uh, they, they don't have a minute during the day. Um, you know, someone, you mentioned to create the suburbs. Uh, so you see uh, the mothers, mostly, and sometimes fathers, they, they're driving this child to the uh, soccer game and that child someplace else, and then all to, and they don't have a minute to think. So they, when they look at the, the new technology, they, they're not rejecting any of them, but they're saying this has made me a little nuts. Yeah. Okay, um, I do think that the efficiency are the value of technology. I think that's how a lot of the technology that's called this conflict is uh, is uh, directed from food production and then if you've done enough time with enough manpower, it's a technological point. Um, I think that the problem with that today you know, people um, having enough time today is not to do with technology but to have that to do with the fact that technology is having an expectation. It's actually a lot more fun today using the technology that they supposedly make that easy to do. And instead of the expectations, the constantly given pressure to see what else we want to be talking about. All right. Well, well the yeah. Okay. And of course, technology. So you, you, what you're saying is, in a way, it's not the technology, but the fact, the way people have allowed the technology to control their attitudes. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Of course, it's all a package. We have to think about it together. Take uh, the great Protestant ethic, so-called, that I mentioned before, uh, that the best way to earn God's favor is to be disciplined, uh, to delay gratification. Um, that's been changed. Uh, the best way to earn God's favor is to buy things. Just buy things. It doesn't matter what you buy, just buy. And God will reward you in the end. I think that's sort of the great American religion at the moment. Now, I'm not, you can't say in a way, well, that's television that's done that. I mean, the, the technology itself. That would be foolish. But you could say the way we have used. Do you know that the average uh, American kid by age 20 will have watched in the neighborhood of 600,000 television commercials? Now, uh, anyone, I mean, you wouldn't need to do a big time study to say, if someone goes through the first 20 years of his or her life seeing 600,000 television commercials, each one, by the way, or maybe not each one, but most of them, being a kind of narrative, a story that has a real uh, uh, ideology inside it, every problem is solvable. Every problem is solvable fast and every problem is solvable fast through the uh, use of some drug, some technique, some technology. 
Yeah, oh, listen. I think it's the television that I've made that the you just came in. <laughs> he was watching our first day before he came in. Hey, is this what you're talking about? Yeah, no, that's all right. Yeah, we're running so, out of time. No, actually, I had, um, I suppose we're running out of time, but I had a challenge I wanted to put to you and separately a question I wanted to ask. And what would that be? The challenge is... Well, what <laughs> The challenge is, uh, we've been talking so much about education and technology in particular today. Um, one of the insights you had in the Technopoly book is the way in which technology is derived from technique, which is simply a repeated process that you realize being able to disengage your brain helps you out. You can just do this process, and it usually gets you where you want to go. And what is even a class in the absence of electricity but the presence of a start time and a stop time and we shall meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then there shall be a midterm and then a midterm. What is that but technology? That's a technique. Absolutely. And if you grant that, then it seems that the baseline you describe, NYU 1959, is as steeped in technology as NYU 1999 it's just different technologies. And if that's the case, then again, I put to you the Bill Gates question. You must be a lawyer. <laughs> you, <are done. laughs> you must be a critic. <laughs> yeah. I put it to you, Mrs. Carrick. Isn't it true, yes. Nan, <laughs> that the challenge for you then is to not get stuck or ossified in whatever technology has worked so well for you as a teacher or as a learner that you've embraced it and can see no easy better, but to see what's out there. And it's true, the, the people who have adopted it in the first round, and certainly the people who peddle it in the first round, are ones who are completely optimistic about its uses and careless about its applications. But that doesn't mean it has no use. I mean, I, we're in a room in which this is a highly teched up room since you were last in it, and uh, one in which it's very subtle. But, you know, the, the blackboards spring up and screens are behind them, and there's a camera hidden up there, and there's, there's Ethernet in every jack, yeah. Uh, and some of the people in this room uh, who are in it once a week as part of my class are joining in an experiment in which we try out different things. Some of them fail miserably and comically. Others are pretty interesting. And to have you on the forefront of testing this stuff out would be a benefit both to yourself and to well, the enterprise. There are a number of answers, Jonathan. One is um, uh, I, to some extent, I am ossified, to use your unkind... Well, it was all hypothetical, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I do, uh, when it comes to uh, new technologies, remember I said at the beginning, I think some of those questions have application to a culture and should be part of the politics, the political dialogue of a culture, but also they are, uh, could be used individually. I mean, I do ask myself, personally, will this technology benefit me in some way? And uh, if not, of course, I pass, pass it over, but also ask, suppose it does benefit me in some way, what will be the cost? So, I mean, I do ask these questions. I don't have uh, 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 this, uh, uh, what is it called, waiting, because if I'm having a conversation with you, I, I was just brought up this way. It would be rude for me to say, Jonathan, there's someone else calling me now who might be more interesting than you. So I'm going to take that call. But you do have a telephone. I do. And had the first implementation of the telephone been with call waiting because of the way they wired it, and the innovation yeah. in the late 90s was actually the busy signal, you'd adopt it. But, okay, here's another point, John. In, um, in the Phaedrus by, well, Socrates, Plato's Phaedrus, um, this is Irving Plato. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Socrates, uh, who wrote no books, 
and it's not for Plato and Xenophon, we, we know almost nothing about them, speaks against writing. This is not printing, this is the written word, phonetic writing. And he gives three reasons why he's against it. One is that if we write everything down, we'll lose our memory, which happened. Remember, the average Athenian youth of the time, before text, had to commit to memory all of the epic poetry. This is as the Iliad and the Odyssey by memory, and that was just the beginning. Whereas you, who are the elite of American education, would collapse if you had to memorize Paul Revere's ride. <laughs> Does this mean you're dumber? No, of course not. At least so you will argue. <laughs> because you will say, if you want to know Paul Revere's ride, I'm not going to memorize it. I'll go to the library and get it for you. But Socrates was worried that memories would decline in their power, which happened. He was worried that the concept of privacy would be wrecked because he says whenever you write something down you never know whose eyes will fall on it and whose eyes will not and then the third which i'm sure you see every day in your classes he says it has a wonderful line he says writing forces the student to follow an argument rather than to participate in it and whenever you see students busily taking notes, that's a, um, uh, you know, an example of it. So here's what I'm driving at, Jonathan. Um, if I had been, I fancy, if I had been uh, living in Mainz, Germany in 1456, and I heard about Gutenberg's uh, invention, I would have been against it. <laughs> Not against it. I would have said, listen, before we go ahead, you know, the first 50 years of the invention of the printing press with the movable type, over 8 million books were printed. This is like, um, this is, you want to talk about a revolution. You think computers are a revolution. Imagine the impact on, on culture where you, you go from a manuscript culture to machine-made books. Eight million books on almost every conceivable subject. So, I, if I had lived in Germany, I would have said in German, of course. Gutenberg, don't get excited here. Let's talk about this. I'm not against books. Gutenberg, do you realize if you go ahead with this, because he's got an old wine press that he's working on, if you go ahead with this, you may want to go ahead, but if you do, it's going to help bring down the Holy Roman See. And you're a devout uh, Roman, well, Catholic, everyone was. Let's give the dark ages yeah. a chance. You, you're, you're going to bring about a religious split in Europe that will cause more deaths than you could imagine. You want to go ahead with it. And he might say, well, he said, you can't bury it. Once someone, as a matter of fact, seven different cities in Germany claim to be the birthplace of the printing press with movable type. And some of them have a better claim than Mainz and, and Gutenberg. But we just agree for simplicity's sake that it's Gutenberg. So, so maybe this was a meme, or whatever they call it, that, that new word. Uh, an idea whose yeah. time has come. An idea whose time has come. Uh, so uh, well, here's what I'm trying to say, John. You need people like me in the world. You know why you need people like me? Because you're, you need people who say, not that they're against it, but before you commit yourself, your heart and your soul and your intellectual habits and your social life and your political ideas to the thrall 
of this new technology. Let's have a conversation about it. I mean, look, if we had had a conversation, Jonathan, about the combustion engine in, say, 1910, it is just possible we could still have our cars, but we would not have sick in the air and sick in the cities and created the suburbs. Uh, the cities might still be vital places. We might have had a car, but prepared ourselves for it. So this brings me to the question. I see Marlo wants to get in. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you the question. And that is, you've shown how a conscientious person might ask some questions, whether buying a Toyota or staring at a box of computers in a classroom, as to whether to make the personal decision to adopt right. the technology. You've even shown how an institution might collectively come to that decision, a school district or right. something like that. You've given one example of how a collective people can do so in the supersonic transport. That example, I think, has few companions because it's rare that the market is structured so there can be that deliberation. In the supersonic transport case, you had airports, you had permits. I mean, the government was all over it already, and the government had to make a decision. When you talk about the adoption of call waiting or the use yeah. of laptops generally... But, but, but you know, there are other examples, like the whole uh, environmental movement, which certainly has national implications, has aroused people's questions about... Uh, it's uh, affecting so, law, too, about what people would be permitted to do if there would be certain consequences for the environment. So I guess my question is then, are you satisfied with the forums that exist right now within our polity to allow somebody like you or a would-be environmentalist to raise the alarm, get Congress going, get the culture going, and then maybe yeah, have a it's, decision? It's all right because... Uh, it, it's all right because... Uh, 25, 30 years ago, you could draw a bigger crowd if, uh, for a lecture if the topic was how to improve your backhand in tennis than you could on this subject. But now I think that's different. Uh, parents have become aware of the impact of television on their children. Uh, the environmentalists have shown that uh, every policy decision we make concerning technology, or almost everyone, has implications for the environment. Lawyers are involved. Uh, academics are involved. You know, critics are involved. Even the actors and entertainers are involved. So that I'm very happy <laughs> you know, in quotes, uh, 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 about the, uh, the, the possibility that the questions we've been discussing here are, uh, are being raised. By, I mean, people know about these things. They talk about it, and politicians now talk about it. Of course, uh, Al Gore says... Um, uh, the reason he's so much in favor of what is just generally called the uh, information superhighway, I mean, you know, it's sort of a, an abstract term, but uh, is that it w we will have access, or we could have access, to 500 or 1,000 television stations. Well, I mean, I would ask, I, I think we can ask Gore, is that a problem that most Americans yearn to have solved? Do we really think that the 50 or 60 we currently uh, have access to are uh, not enough to provide us with what we want? I mean, we can get into this conversation. Uh, so I, I'm, I think we're doing all right. I mean, I, we were behind uh, we Americans because of the adoration for technology. We just love technology and made the mistake of believing that Technological innovation and human progress were exactly the same thing. And, and I think now we, we don't believe that, so we're beginning to talk about it. Even right up here in Harvard, which is you know, always behind 
and talking about anything of importance. So, I'm just I forgot you. <laughs> Thank you, but, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Last word from Bob. Yes, sir. One other question that I, I'd like you to add to your list. Okay. It would be something where, you know, in spite of uh, our parody's uh, images, we yeah, think we could always agree about technology, which is that the new technology separates people into the connect. Great question. And, and that would be an area where you and I could have a yeah. success. And we have to define what we mean by separate and what we mean by connect. And here's an interesting thing, just final. I thought of it. You know, when new technologies come in, they frequently make old technologies obsolete. Sometimes completely obsolete, as in the case of the printing press, you know, made uh, a manuscript culture obsolete. You have to go to a museum to see one now. Sometimes they just modify it all. Now, I would have thought that the invention of the machine made book in the 15th century, and then, of course, a lot of texts in the 16th, would have made the lecture method. In, uh, in universities obsolete within, within 50 years. I mean, once the students have access to the same texts for uh, a minimal, you know, uh, economically feasible uh, way, why do they need the professor to stand in the front of the room or whatever room it is, even this improved room, talking to people? question. Why did this, I mean, I, would you agree 95% of the classes in American universities today, this is basically the structure. And it's obsolete, you say. So why has it survived for almost 500 years? It may be that there's something about it about, in your question, separating, and they, or maybe you know, Young people need to you, you be communicate a lot more by being new and posting than by, by saying that you're posting. Well, okay, that's, that's okay. But also, maybe they just need to be close to each other. I mean, maybe there's something, yeah, something like this that so that helps this survive. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think. The idea that people are asking questions like this is it's not pervasive in the culture, not enough, but it's going, and I'm very happy, and I thank you all for allowing me into your August calls. <laughs> So this conversation between Barlow and Postman, at least, will continue at 7 p.m. at the Sackler Gallery. Uh, it's only 5.15 right now, is that right? It's only 5.15, so it will continue at 7 o'clock at the Sackler Gallery. I think you need tickets. If you don't have them, I have a couple extras, and if you don't have them even after that, I think they'll still let you in, uh, but I can't guarantee it. It's uh, just by the fire station, the Cambridge Fire Station. Uh, near the science center? Yeah, you left kind of a when you come up and oh, yeah. uh, I just felt when we were just really accepting the award. Ah, I had a great time. Oh, I'm going to go to Are you going over to the bookstore to find out? I don't want to have that. Are you going to do there now? We're out of NPR in preparation.